Hey, you there. Thank you for watching and welcome to Forge Lines Forever. Today I have a 6v6 custom match here on the most uh, amazing Neuroxis Map Generator. So let's go ahead and introduce our teams and our players. Starting for Team 1 in the West, ending with Team 2 in the East. Starting up from the South and working away northward, we have in Stitch Blue, Kramer. He is a Cybern for this match. And he is a 1,000 rated player to his north by northeast. We have in Chevy Crimson, a UEF. It is Stinky Joe. He is a 1,000 rating as well. Continuing on here in the middle of the map here for Team 1, we have Nazar89 as another UEF here. He is a 1,300 in orange, the color orange. In Pac Manuela to his north is the Aeon player of Zerbit. The seventh, gonna call him Zerbit for short. He is a 1300 in Light Oak Town to his northeast. We have as another UEF for Team One is Grin. He is in Light Oak Town as a 1100. And last but not least, last but not least, there, excuse me, for Team One in Imperial Gray is the highest rated player in all of the match here. He is Yoji as an Aeon. He is. A 2,000 rated, and again, he is the highest rated player on his team and in the game overall. So for Team 1 side of the map, they're going with the Classics. They don't have a Seraphim. They have two Aeons, three UEF, and one Cybran. Starting off with the northern side of things here for Team 2, and then working away southward, we have in Barbie Pink, making sure that it actually is Barbie Pink. He is Psycho Ad. He is a Cybran, and he is... And 1,800, he is the highest rated player on Team 2. In Rush to his Southwest, we have the Sher not sorry, the Seraphim player of New, New Gun? Neo, Neo Gun, not New Gun, Neo Gun. He is an 1,100, and as always, I am very bad with names. We have in Forest Green, the best color and faction combination in all of Supreme Commander Dumb. It is literal going as a UEF in forest green as a 1500 in glow in the dark green here to his south we have the uef player of Cy cyrido cyrido you call him Cy for short he is again a uef as a 1300 in ruby red to his southeast already on the move is gamble c z he is an Aeon for this match, and he is a 1,000 rated. And in the southeastern corner here of the map, we have the lightest red pink player of Squealer. He is an 1,100. So for Team 2 side of the map, they have three UEF as well, but they also have one Aeon, one Seraphim, and one Cybran, making the difference between Team 2 and Team 1. That Team 2 has one Seraphim player, and Team 1 has two Aeon players instead of a one and one in that regard. And for 12 players on the map, let's take a look at that reclaim count. Currently sitting at 20, almost 8,000 mass in reclaim, which means it's over 2K mass per player. And the majority of it kind of sitting in this nice little W shape. You can see it, you know, 3,000, 3,000, almost 3,000, and then 5,000 in the middle here, and then a 2,000. And then kind of upwards, the reclaim has already been scooped up. And for mass point layouts, there are five Trimax positions, essentially almost in the exact vertical line. They're kind of a little bit off one way or the other, but if you could probably take the average of their positions, it's roughly a line, which means that one player on each team won't get a Trimax position, but we'll just see how it does go off with that in terms of you know egos and balancing and that sort of thing there are a couple of one-offs of course near the main bases so again necessarily won't be out of mixes besides the core mass but you know it's kind of obviously distributions with players one player wants more one player wants you know or every player wants more but some players other players want even more than uh rough equality nonsense and really interesting about this map you see this upper plateau section over here which, I mean, it houses four of those quad mix positions. We do see that both teams have either dropped units off or they're starting to distance build. Squealer is just going to distance build over here, and Team 1 has dropped a couple of units over here to claim that plateau. And regulars, right down the middle, there's not really a lot of shared mixes. There's a couple of mixes down here. That's really about it. We have decent avenues of attack for land, but essentially in the south, the only way to get to the other side of the map is either go straight west or east, 
right essentially below the middle you know horizon line or cut down the middle whatever line it is or the essentially the southern 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 edge of the map and not really a good environment to throw experimentals and even if somebody did that experimental would be locked at this upper plateau so is it going to be worth it to push on through or is it going to be worth it to go around we'll just have to see as time goes on and i will note there is one pro player on each team. I mean, literal is a 1500, so he's kind of on the nice little border between pro and Joe. But there's essentially one pro leading, for the most part, a bunch of Joes. So we'll see if Yoji's leadership or Team 2 Psycho Ad's leadership is the thing that carries either team over the edge. Team 1's going for a couple of guns here in the north. Grin going for his combo of damage and range and yoji going for his range upgrade first we do see yoji sending out a couple of nonsense scouts some flares some light assault bots to just annoy his opponent of psycho who's going for more forward land facilities we do see in the middle of the map neo gun having at it with his slightly off color you know to him of nizar 89 in the sense that he's rust and that he's facing off against orange and just having some disagreements of how the color scheme works for the other faction. We do see Sai in the kind of mid-south position going for a T2 upgrade. Of course, the comm of Gambler coming in to assist. There are three commanders here for Team 2. Team 1 in the north has a 2v1 scenario, and in the south it's a 1v0, but I don't even count the one for Squealer because he's not even up here yet. We do see drops have been initiated and transports successful in grabbing this uh, other section of this plateau. Denying Team 2 this Trimex position, getting forward factories online means it's going to annoy Team 2 even more as time goes on. We do see that one player on Team 1 has not left their main base, and that is Kramer, who has gone for a T2 air facility, so he's going to be an air player for this match. And in the north, maybe we'll see Yoji go for an airplane. Maybe we'll see somebody else in the middle. I mean, given a map like this, there is a decent amount of avenues for land, but especially in the south where it's very much bottlenecked either here or on the very much bottleneck down here. It's going to be probably favoring long-range strategies, whether that be missiles, artillery, game enders. Usually those are artillery or nukes or an infinite money glitch. Or even, you know, my favorite thing, just kabooming everything around. It's always fun and entertaining to say that a lot in cast. We do see that the gun speed slash range upgrades are done on Yoji's Commander. Psycho Ad doesn't have any sort of upgrades besides his gun. So he is on even footing with his opponent besides the fact that he has down 1,000 hit points. Because he has a Cyber and, and Yoji is an Aeon. We do see a little bit of units break off from the main group to just distract a little bit of the APM for Yoji. Will that make a difference? I don't think so, but we'll just have to see if it does or not. Nano repair started here for Little. He has gun already on board. T2 already halfway done here for Neo Gun. We do see Nizar going for T2 as well. So lots of gun upgrades, or I should say more utility upgrades, not gun upgrades, coming online for Team 1 and Team 2 in the middle. We do see Stinky Joe is going to be facing off against Sai here shortly. He doesn't have any upgrades, which will, of course, have a net benefit for Team 2. Wouldn't be surprised if Team 1's player doesn't go for that, being Stinky Joe. I mean, he's kind of out there by himself. He doesn't have a lot of supporting factories nearby. There's some units just holding position here for Cytro, Cyrito. It's like Dorito and like Cyzalon or something. The way that I say it, for some reason, it sounds like that together. Anyway, and this... Uh, southern section of the map here has turned from a west versus east to almost kind of like a north v south essentially we do see units holding position here for squealer but still he's facing off a battle against two fronts that's not gonna build well if it does continue we do see that little is starting to pressure team one we do see that zerb is also here going for his range upgrade so it's a 2v3 in favor of team two and of course we do see grin is still here he's holding position with a bunch of factories to spam out some units. Shield coming online here for Yoji. And no stealth upgrade yet here for Psycho. We'll see if he goes for that or goes for something else spicier. I highly doubt he'll go for a laser this quickly, but who knows? I mean, 
There's no, there's no way. There's no way somebody would go for laser this early. It's not even 10 minutes on the clock. We do see Little continuing to just slowly poke and prod at these defenses in the middle. Again, he has nano, so he can, quote-unquote, afford to, quote-unquote, spend hit points. But, again, if you spend too many hit points, you're looking at a, a debt, and that debt could be called in, and it will trade in your life for that debt, which is, I guess, worse than just being in debt. We do see that Stinky Joe has fallen back. This Triumph Exposition is gone. Looks like some units inbound from Team 2 came in and ripped that apart. There are some nearby units now that are dealing with those little invaders from Team 2, but it has given a little bit of ground for Sai to push in and take the middle. Again, not many really a lot of mixes to actually hold, but again, some denying is better than no denying. And he's also starting to, again, kind of creep out and slowly grab them. At least I would assume he would. Stealth has been started here for Psychoad. He is rooted to the spot. It does give Yoji an advantage. He's going to go straight east. I don't know if he knows where the commander of... No, he does know where he is, so he can you know easily divert if he needs to. That upgrade is now... I've lost the percentage, but it's probably like 25% or something. Maybe close to 30-something. So we'll see if that upgrade does finish it, if he cancels it or not. Chrono Dampener has been started for Zerb. Very interesting. We hardly see that Aeon upgrade. Able to, of course, EMP most units. No commanders, no experimentals, but you know, pretty much most units are slightly annoyed by having to be uh, rebooted on the spot. In Team 2's momentum is quite... It's just mounting here. We do see that Cyrito continuing to push against Stinky Joe. Team 1 is losing this mid-south position and lane. We do see that Nazar is having to pull units off of his front line to deal with this incursion. A lot of pillars coming online here for Cyrito as well, so he has a lot of backing, not only in the momentum side of things, but the firepower as well. We do see that Squealer still just pumping out facilities and units trying to deal with this position. These facilities have been taken out. So at least the remaining forces are not going to get reinforcements for the time being, thanks to this nice little tactical missile a launcher inbound from Gembler targeting those facilities specifically. Great play there. And also going to knock out the radar. Also a great play. Knock out the opponent's eyes and then knock out everything else. We do see the upgrade is now done for Psychoad. And he's gone straight for Nano as well. So while Team 1's Yoji has a shield, Team 2 has a Nano. So again, an extra 8,000 hit points. Sorry, actually the shield's offline. He might uh, having some power issues. Yeah, oh, yeah. He's having, oh, he's starting to get it fixed, but he's having some power issues. So that upgrade actually benefiting him nothing, while the Psychoad upgrade of the Nano variety is at 78 hit points a second regen. So huge benefit to him. And still no movement here from Team 1's Kramer. He's going for T3 Air currently. Is anybody else on Team 1 going for Air? No, Team 2 going for air. I would assume at least one player will. Looks like that is going to be the player of Squealer. He's also played a decent amount of land as well, so he's had to divvy up resources from going for straight air to land and air. That's why it's about 13 and a half minutes at that upgrade about to be completed. Still nobody has died as of yet, but I have a sinking suspicion that one of these fronts, most likely one of these uh, three up here, is not going to feel well. We do see that Team 2's Seraphim player of Neogun has actually shifted north to counter this potential moving in from Grin. So it's a 1v1, 1v1, 2v2, 1v1, 0v1. But again, Squeezer is going back to his base. So it really is just a 0v0 with just units firing at one another. And in the north, we see again just poking and prodding. Yoji getting a little annoyed at those missiles firing at him. Psychoad just continuing to just make sure that nothing gets by him. Team 1, this is what Team 1 can see for, you know, Team 2 side of the map. And then for Team 2, this is what they can see. They can see where the comm is, which can be deadly. And will Yoji get out of there if something does happen? I think he will. He's a 2,000 rated player. You know, Psychoad's also an 1,800. So they, they know this game quite well. And in the middle here, we do see that Zerbit trying to trying to hook maneuver around. There's this nice wall section he'll have to deal with. Essentially forces everything coming from essentially the northwest either go all the way around or 
comes straight through the middle, which is exactly what Team 2 wants. Team 1 is, again, going to be just firebasing wars against Team 2 at this point, and it's just going to be a back and forth for a while. Large group of units moving in to seize the opportunity of the fact that Neogun has sent all of his forces north. Yoji is mostly in retreat. He does have some T3 units online coming to back him up. Sakued might be going in for the kill here. Yoji is you know, still suffering no shields, which means those 8,000 hit points not coming in handy. Overcharges, of course, being thrown back and forth between those two players. And Neogun's going to get invaded here. He actually might be the first casualty of the game. We see a lot of T1 spam, a couple of Mongeese as well. So I highly doubt this attack will net in a loss for Team 1. Again, a lot of facilities are going down. Mexes are going down. We do see the focus of the fire does occur here against Neil Gunn's commander. Literal sending some forces in. I, uh, It's going to be close, but Neil Gunn does have gun and T2 on board and just got a rank in veterancy in the north. I'm going to have to split things at this point. We're looking like another face-off between Team 1 and Team 2's highest rate of players. There they are up there, and I'll focus the... Uh, Kind of shifted a little bit over there so you can still detect what's going on. Neogun getting those reinforcements inbound from Literal will help out a lot. He's got to keep moving, though. Those units still catching up to him. That distance, and now Team 2's Psycho Ed gets annihilated by those T3 Harbingers and Yoji's commander. Yoji plopped on the shield. I think he lured his opponent into a false sense of security, activated the shield. It completely filled the bar and essentially uh, drew him in and killed him. So Team 2 loses their highest rated player sub 20 minutes. That is a huge loss for Team 2, especially now that uh, there's this invading amount of units, especially T3 variety, moving in from Yoji in the north. We do see that Neogun does get out of danger, so they don't lose two players very quickly, or one after the other. But that is going to be a nice little victory for Team 1, sitting at a 6v5 in favor of the Western team of Team 1. But, of course, literal does get two bases now. So he's sitting at over 240 mass per second. Everybody else in the game is 150 and lower than that, which means literal has a lot of firepower, quite literally, behind him in terms of the eco department. Unfortunately, he is being assailed by these harbingers. Yoji also pressing a couple of bricks coming off that frontline T3 land facility. And I uh, I don't think it's going to last that much longer. A couple of uh, PD have been taken out. That harbinger about to die. That one about to get its shield back. Overcharge almost kills this brick. Brick has killed off one of those harbingers all by its lonesome, essentially. About to get another kill. T3 land facility does get eaten alive. The brick about to be overcharged. There it goes. And there was also a missile. Missile? How does artillery look like? Mm, oh, it could have been a missile. There's a missile launcher right here. And it's just, for literal, it's just how long can you keep Yoji at bay? He's sending units all the time. Asylums. We have some of those redeemers. T3 AA harbingers are inbound all the time. Units get transported up here. A couple of Mongeese. There is a T1 PD emplacement, a shield, and a nice little uh, stealth field generator, which means it's going to be very difficult to keep the uh, sights on that tactical missile launcher for long. You can see this is what Team 1 can see. And it should go away eventually, or maybe they have an Omni. No, they only have a T1. Oh, I think it's it's more units, I think, than uh, than anything else. But the stealth field generator is on, so... Yeah, you can't see the units, but you can at least see the structures, because structures don't move technically, so that that's fair. For some reason, I thought the radar signatures went away for everything, but it's just the units. We do see a missile or artillery. It is artillery inbound from Stinky Joe attacking the lower section of the map here against... His opponent of Cyrito, who he's currently facing off with, with his commander. But Cyrito's commander has actually fallen back. Looks like he's going to his main base, or at least to the water, to protect himself. And yeah, there's a little bit of water on this map. There isn't a terrible amount of it. It's just enough to hide a couple of units or use maybe for, you know, maybe some T3AA or something just to, you know, put something there. 
We do see the main base here for Second Red is under assault. Lots of Harbingers essentially creating a nice buffer zone for Yoji to get Engineers out, reclaim everything that was up here, and get his comm back to base, or at least further back. More and more bricks are coming off the line, and we see some Titans being thrown north as well to assist in defensive operations. And we do see a T3 land headquarters. No, is he building another T3? He is building another T3 land headquarters, I think. Or maybe it's just a T2 one. Or sorry, a T3 like a system factory. Hmm. Anyway, yeah, that's probably what it is. In the middle of the map, Team 1 highly expanded their fire basing wars against Team 2. Multiple stealth field generators just make it more annoying to target units. And Grembler is really suffering here, trying to get TMD online. It isn't enough. He needs to get out of there. There's lots of missiles inbound all the time. We do see there are a decent amount of T2 and now T3 land facilities pumping out some Percy's. That will stave off a direct assault, but nothing indirect, which is what those missiles are lovely known for. We do see some spearheads also online here for Sagrito trying to target whatever was up here on this upper plateau that it either missed or did shoot down. But success for Team 2. They've pretty much shoved Team 1 away. There's a couple of PD and one lonely mechs still up there. And a radar system, which, again, it's really good for Team 1 because it gets them a decent amount of radar coverage here. They essentially can see roughly the middle of this nice little, of course, alleyway here. But this Southern Assault not looking super good here for Team 1. We do see some gunships online for the air player of Kramer dealing with a couple of roaming little harbingers from his opponent of Grembler. ASF's inbound just to kind of have a nice little skirmish over here. They are whalers, these gunships, so they do have some decent AA on board. It aren't as good as the... Restorers, of course, but are better than the broadsword in that regard. We do see a gun, sorry, not a gun, a calm shield upgrade coming online for Grin in the north, who already has gun on board. And in the middle, we do see that Yoji's forces shift south, essentially isolate Neo Gun from his base, and he has really nothing to protect himself. There are units moving in from literal, but this is just going to be a blitz attack to get as far deep into enemy territory as possible for Yoji. Love this uh, attack vector here. There's really nothing that Team 2 has. Of course, the land, not the land, the water makes it a little bit annoying to deal with in terms of pathfinding. Of course, Percy's don't really care about water because they just walk underneath the surface of it or on the bottom of the lake or the water, the pond, whatever you want to call it. Hover tech units, of course, hover over the water. The Harbingers don't do that, but they are a very, very quick T3 unit. So they're able to really catch up to those uh, asylums and protect them. Would like to see some AA coverage in this mix, but this is all about fast, 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 kill, kill, kill. And it's really going to hurt Team 2's eco, specifically, of course, literal. Speaking of which, Team 1 and Team 2 sitting at about 1.1k mass for each team. So we're paying roughly, you know, similar or exactly even between these two teams at 22, almost 23 minutes on the clock. Team 1 has not lost anybody. Team 2 has lost the only player, and that is Psycho Ad, and he was killed off by Yoji. Not early early on but uh you know 13 14 minutes on the clock let me know down in the comments who you think is going to currently win this game of course if you haven't done so already please like the video subscribe to the channel share this video with your friends family and your pets and of course thank you so much for watching to roughly the midpoint of the video and hopefully you will continue to watch towards the end of it or to the end of it or the end of it or whatever english that i want to <laughs> spit out as i completely just slur half of my words we do see that the Harbinger threat has been dealt with here by Little and some assistance from these bombers from Cyrito. So minimal losses. It isn't as bad as I expected it to be. T3 land headquarters does get taken out for the UEF side of things for Little. So he's really going to be annoyed about that. But uh, he, of course, still has his engineers. And, of course, he has his comm as well. So he does secure his UEF tech for the entirety of this game until he dies. And then somebody else on Team 2 will have to carry the UEF torch. We do see in the south, Squealer gaining lots of ground here. Again, just trying to keep no sort of you know, real military strength here for Team 1 in this southern plateau, whatever you want to call this thing. We do see that uh, almost looks like Kramer has not taken a single step. He probably has, but he's not left his main base. He's getting an SMD online. Love to see that early, going for a nice little expansion to his air grid. 
And not going for a box, going for a stick. Going for a nice little thin hor horizontal, thin rectangle. There's going to be a little bit of, of course, some volatile explosion possibilities, but it won't be as volatile as if there was a third um, row of pigeon slash uh, air facility. So he's trying to keep it nice and tight, nice and, uh, you know, essentially thinned out. So good on him for doing that to avoid a possible just annihilation of his air grid from a couple of artillery shots or whatever else may come through his base. A couple of Percy's thrown together here from Cyrito. Charge the calm of Thinky Joe, who has shield T3 and gun and a two-star vet commander, which means that's a lot of hit points on board to chew through. There are, of course, some Ravagers in the mix. But those Percy's, they are known for chewing through high HP units. There are some Percy's here for Stinky Joe. But he's not using them to really target well, not all of them exactly, but Stinky Joe might just die here. He does get some of those parashields in to try to shield himself, quite literally. One shot almost kills the commander, barely misses. It was a very close call here for Stinky Joe. He drops way too far below what you would probably assume he would have fell through, fell down to in that regard. And he's almost at three-star veterancy, but 19,000 hit points in shield, 18,000 hit points in actual whole armor. That's a well, armor hit points, I should say. So 37,000 hit points. He probably dropped to about 15 or so. So over 35,000 damage. That was, yeah, too close for comfort. No joke. That one shot almost hit you and almost killed you. If you can't tell, it was an almost a close, not almost a close call. It was a close call, but it was almost death. We do see an interesting missile thrown by uh, one of the Monsters here from Team 2, probably that uh, spearhead. A nice little arc there. We do see some units coming in for the assist from the Tsar. A little bit too late to the party, but it is a lot of assistance. What is this? T2 Land Headquarters. 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 T3 Land Headquarters. Why so many headquarters? Why are you building a quantum gateway in the middle of the map? What is this? Build it at your own base very prone to just being walked over and dying. I get it. It cuts down on travel time to the max and is getting an SMD. What is this strategy here from Zerbit? I do not know. All these uh, HQs, the quantum gateway in the middle of the, of the map, the SMD. Again, it's nice to have a lot of coverage for SMD, but that far forward, 27 minutes, I can see some experimentals you know, on the minds of some of these players, like we could just send us some experimentals in and just destroy that entire base and all that uh, investment goes up into flames. So I don't know why it's that far forward. And I don't know why there's that many headquarters, but you want to make sure he has T2 tech and he's going to have it for a while unless there's a nuke, which is probably why he's building that SMD. To the north, we do see an experimental, speaking of which, escorted by some Harbingers, a couple of Asylums, decent amount of Redeemers, love the AA coverage, and of course you always got to keep some T1 light artillery units in your army gotta get that maximum easy kill damage or easy damage onto those structures monkey nearby tons of per is that Percy's excuse me decent amount of Percy's decent amount of bricks and a chunk of those Othams and all of these plus the monkey should be enough to deal with that Colossus this might just be a mass gift from Yoji of course the Colossus locks onto the Monkey Lord's main chassis, and of course the laser actually locking onto the head of uh, that Colossus. So essentially, it's a laser v laser fight, and unfortunately the monkey will die. But its main goal was distract the Colossus from all these T3 units. The T3 units will rip apart that Colossus very quickly with some tickle cannon assistance. And there are some bombers and gunships inbound from Cyrito as well. He has T3 online in the air department. So two air players, one main, and kind of a nice little secondary one to get some you know, additional gunships or ASFs or whatever donated over. They're both UEF, so no issues with just double-clicking on those ASFs or whatever to highlight all of them. You can just hit Control-A and then select what you wanted, but, I mean, who's got time for that kind of thing? Do you see an Omni online for Stinky Joe? Love to see that. He's also gone for T3 Air. And T3 land, but at least T3 air. We do see another T3 air facility here for Team 1. Another, of course, the main air player being Kramer has T3 air. We do see in the north, Yoji has T3 air. At this point, I expect, well, he's not T3 air, but he's T2 for Grin. And the only other player would be 
Nizar. Nizar has not gone for T2 or T3 air, but four out of the six players having T3 air plus a fifth one having T2. That's a huge focus on air. And essentially everybody on Team 1 wanted to make sure they had some sort of air coverage and I can't blame them there. You gotta have your own air coverage, especially in naval battles. You gotta get your own torpedo launchers on board. We do see that uh, nice little bug gets annihilated by some of those Oblivion PD and the walking of the units has commenced. The Bricks, the Percy's, a couple of Othams back there. There's even a nice little Ilshi in there as well, representing the T2. And then a nice little Striker in there, a couple of Lobos as well. So this charge is con con going to continue to mount and not stop anytime soon. Lots of PD are being built to intercept this. Colossus is also inbound, so that attack isn't going to go anywhere. It might deal some damage to the base, but again, there's not really that many vital structures. The vital structures are actually behind it, those being the uh, mixes themselves. Decent battery of uh, missile launchers forming here. The Alohas, the good, the, sorry, not goodbye, but the hello and goodbye missiles are soon to be on the case here for Team 1. We do see that uh, Stinky Joe is inbound. Possibly once again to the front. Maybe he's going to sit under shield coverage. Probably a smart idea just because he was almost killed off earlier on. But his force, high amounts of shields. I love to see that. Love, love, love it. Unfortunately, the only issue, and you could probably say, wait, he's saying don't build as many shields. No, no, no. No, no, no. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, yeah, the amount of shields is great. I love it. You need a lot more direct fire weapons, specifically the Percy's. You do have decent AA coverage with some Cougars. But get more Percy's because once the Percy's are dead, all those shields, they're just nice window dressing. They're there. They're pretty. They're fun to look at. But need more damage. We do see in the middle a huge host of Ascendant T2 Mobile Flag escorting a Colossus. And look at this just outcropping here from Team 1 Zerba. He's like, this is my base now. This, this base, this is my support base. This is my base now. And... So far, it's, I mean, Omni in the middle of the map here. This is the range on board this thing. He sees pretty much the entire map bar the southeastern corner. Huge, huge placement there. Nothing is going to get past him without some bit of either stealth or chicanery or nonsense. Air fight possibly happening here between the two main air players. They're just sitting there waiting to engage. There are some gunships in there as well, so some AA on board those. So Team 2's Wasp will be a little bit uh, underpowered in face of the ASF plus the missiles from those whalers. And I do hear a chicken somewhere. There it is to the north facing off against that Colossus. Colossus just going to laser that thing to death. Chicken cannot compete. Colossus does not continue its laser bombardment just because it gets out of range. Does the, ch the chicken turns around and then the Colossus turns around. I don't know what kind of quote-unquote game of chicken this is. But it is a very weird game of chicken. AA just being ripped apart by this chicken. Colossus turns around once again. Don't know why it didn't stop to chase the chicken to begin with. And the Colossus trying to dodge the main cannons while the Percy's come in and just absolutely reduce this chicken to atoms. There it goes. Team 2 once again kind of just devoid of defenses over here. Especially this area. This area right here has been very void of just the everything in this game. We'll see if Neo Gun survives another attack. Instead of from the west, it's from the south. Tons of T2PD trying to be built as fast as possible, but there's Percy's in the mix. Shield does go down. That Colossus gets absolutely annihilated by Neo Gun using his gun. He has Nano and T3, but he's being blitzed down by Percy's. He's got to get out of range here shortly, or he is dead. Likely he doesn't have to contend with an Ion Storm, because the Colossus don't have one. Those Percy's trying to catch up to that comm, blitzing down all the PD in their wake. Ion Storm activates and no is dead. All this AA is in retreat. Neo Gun's base is not feeling too well, but he is not dead. So second time is uh, the charm here, I guess. Third time might not be the charm, so you have to be very careful in that regard. Two Colossi in the north. They might shift south. There is a crab online. Two Colossus, one crab. Two Colossus win that fight. Two crabs, though. True crabs win that fight. Set, sorry, not second. Third crab already in production. Literally spamming those cybern 
experimentals out and also gets a fat boy online and might possibly go for a nice little artillery emplacement. I love the fact that uh, he builds a shield first, then he builds all the pigeons, then he builds another shield, and then he's going to build the artillery. Love that build order there. You get the thing to protect all the pigeons, the pigeons, and then another backup, and then possibly the artillery. Love to see it. Because he could just build that and not actually build the artillery and still get, of course, a nice little easy template for some power. We do see the Percy's guarding the Chicken Rex, not trying to go for the Colossus Wreck. And, you know, in stark contrast, the Chicken Wreck worth a little bit less than the, uh, the Colossus Wreck, but not by much. The Percy's, unfortunately, of course, uh, will have to retreat. There are some Othams inbound as well as the Com of Neo Gun. There are already engineers inbound to scoop up the mass from the chicken. So Team 2 donates a chicken to Team 1, and Team 1 donates a Colossus to Team 2. So I'd say Team 2 nets a little bit higher in that regard, but uh, not by much, not anything of huge consequence. We do see a large army pushing down at the mid-north here. Missiles are inbound going for... A, a, that was way overkill for it, just a T3 air defense platform. That was a lot of missiles. I don't... Yeah, that's way overkill. One missile per... Uh, mass extractor. You don't need that many that many missiles. Hmm. Anyway. Down the middle here we do see Fat Boy online for Team 1, Fat Boy online for Team 2, and another Fat Boy should be... or maybe that's the same Fat Boy. Looks like that's the same Fat Boy gifted over to Team 2's player of Cyrito. Gunships inbound to assist. Lots of flak. Of course, Team 1 and Team 2 very much vying for control in the gunship department, but ASFs are sent in by Kramer. He is sending his gunships in as well. His ASFs will get there before his gunships do. ASFs going to get a huge engagement here. Get in behind the ASFs from Kramer. Of course, the numbers will heavily favor Team 1. He turns those around and turns the tide of battle quite quickly there. And the only issue with this, of course, is he's fighting under a decent amount of flak. Not a lot, but enough to really kind of you know, have to go home. You got to, like, replace the, a rotor or, you know, some paneling or something because it got blown off. But nothing critical. Not like you lost two engines. If these have two engines, I am assuming they probably have two. But they could just have one. But anyway. Gunships inbound. Going possibly for the snipe of Krembler. Krembler right next to the water. He's going to hide in it. I don't blame him. That's a good strategy. I would do it if I was him. And this base possibly might not last much longer. He has a decent amount of artillery. Nice little stealth field generator. And a couple of... Serenity T3 mobile artillery to just pump artillery on the other side of that little pond there. Gunships are in full retreat. Looks like the flak was inbound to assist. Just so many yellow dots. So, so, so many yellow dots. 36 minutes on the clock. And these players definitely have to be thinking about how to end this game at some point. We do see that Neo Gun trying to build a nice little secondary wall defense. Two crabs coming in to assist from literal snipes inbound possibly. And there he goes. Team 2's player of Neo Gun defeated by Grin before the missiles could kill him. Which means the Percy's got the kill there. But it would have been, you know, probably the Percy. I mean, it would have been the same player regardless, but yeah. Yeah, Percy's have long, better range. Yeah, they do. They're really, really good at one-on-one uh, -on -one fights in that regard. But it is now a 6v4 in favor of Team 1, the Western team. Team 2's literal now gets another base. And this was his original base, so he's probably not going to donate this one. He's had this one for a while, so he's probably just going to keep this one from his teammate of Neogun. So he now has a UEF base, a Cybern base, and a Seraphim base. All he needs is, not to be a little mean, but Grembler to die, and then he gets that base, and he has one of each base. <laughs> Whatever unit... Whatever game ender, whatever the heck he wants to build, he has access to it. He doesn't have to ask for an engineer, unless he already has one, but then you could just have a whole base. We do see in the north, Crab pushes in, going after all of this PD. He's sending the bricks down to just kind of whittle down all of the other, you know, secondary tertiary, all the other defenses. Crab down here, Crab over here, Chicken right there, Fat Boy right there. Obviously, we've seen the Colossus. We've seen the monkey, so we've seen all of the land experimentals in the game. Maybe we'll see air next. We definitely won't see navy, because I highly doubt somebody's going to put an Atlantis or a Tempest in the water, but who knows? That could happen. I highly doubt it, but it could. 
Fat Boy V, Fat Boy Fire, and this, this is a situation where all of the shields come into play. So many shields, and as they, of course, get taken offline with the capacity to regen underneath the protection of other shields there. Fat Boy in retreat, so many shields being pumped out now by Team 2, Cyrito just to compete. So much coverage, but of course they are weak once the shield is down. Not a lot of hit points on board, 150 hit points to be exact. Sayrita builds another experimental, uh, most likely, yes, it is a fat boy and building another one and building another one. So he might even have four of them online here shortly. ASF's being sent in from Zerbit. Don't know where they're going. Don't have any idea why they're there, but they're there. It's not like he has any fighter bombers or anything like that to throw at that fat boy, but he sent them in for some reason and then went, nah, I don't want to send them in. In the north, though, Team 2 is literally punching back and trying to shove Galactic Colossus and Yoji back. Tons of shields, as we see lots of shields being built by players on Team 1. Of course, we do see that crab is dealt with most of those bricks, and now the crab, no, sorry, the crab, the Colossus, and now there are gunships inbound from Yoji going after that Mega with a couple of artillery emplacements also down here, these Serenities targeting that crab. The crab not going to feel good here shortly, sitting at 50,000 hit points versus 67, but that might just be enough for that Colossus to win with the assistance of artillery and some restorers nearby. One flat cannon, a nice little banger. Five-star vetted banger. Almost 2,000 mass killed, and there it goes. Gets grabbed and pretty much immediately crushed. That crab tries to save its life, but unfortunately it is unable to. It is very close. Will the crash damage? No, it should be enough hit points. Yeah, I was going to say it's about 8,000 or so, so Colossus does, does live to fight another day, but it's essentially out of the fight for the time being. Fat Boy charging. Fat Boy, Fat Boy behind. Chicken charging forward to try to give some space for the Fat Boy to do its work. We do see that huge shift in map control here in the mid-south here. Team 1's player of Stinky Joe, who almost died to Team 2's push, is now being pushed. Not being pushed. Is doing the pushing and pushing it back against Cyrito. Cyrito back here, essentially, right where his uh, opponent was earlier on. His calm in the water. I don't blame him. He's hiding transports inbound with some harbingers on board from Gambler. Love to see it. The ASFs for Team 1 just sitting there, and they see the transports. They may shoot one of them down before they get a chance. Would have loved to see some AA in this mix. And there is not. An explosion happens. Happens to the east. I think it's an SACU. There are some strap bombers inbound from Team 1's player of Kramer as well. Artillery online for Team 2 Squealer. Those uh, Harbingers do get a nice landing. Unfortunately, one Strat Bombers come in. Two, there's also some gunships that can easily be called in to deal with this. Group of Harbingers goes down. And maybe a bomb or two will be the end of that attack. I love the play. I just wish that it had some AA coverage. But it might take out a T3 Max, which is, you know, better than nothing. But there's just too many strat bombers. Team 2, of course, now knows about that, specifically uh, Gambler. And if they're in comms or whatever, easy to report that to his air player. In the north, any spicy plays? Artillery has been started by Yoji. Looks like artillery also has been started here by Zerbit. Two emissaries love to see it. Pings over here. Looks like engineer transferred over for UEF Tech for Yoji. That satellite spam has been started by Stinky Joe. You gotta love those satellites and tons of hives helping to pump out ASF. Team One's air player, I mean, it's, he really has a huge advantage. He has, you know, decent amount of strat bombers running around. Set 11 to be, in fact, 76 ASFs. Team Two Squealer sitting at 111, though. And Gembler sitting at a nice little 24. So 150, roughly, for Team Two. And for Team One, not as many. There are, of course, some ASFs to the north here for Zerbit. Not as many. But, uh, you know, a nice little 15 with some restorers. Never hurt anybody. And, of course, there are restorers for Yoji as well. So, what Team 1 lack in ASF count, they make up for in AA gunship. So, nice little uh, exchange there. I feel like in the long term, Team 1's Kramer will catch up just because he's really pumping out. Except for the fact that... Uh, that just happened. He took a T3 mechs to the face. He took an artillery shot to the face in his pocketbook. Took his 
He took an artillery shot straight in the back, back where he puts his wallet, where he has his uh, pocketbook. Wow, I cannot speak today. My nose is like all clogged up again. I don't know what it is about this time of year. My sinuses and all that just get out of whack. So apologies if you hear any like noises from that. I'm trying to like not have to blow it, like, you know, sneeze. Not blow my nose, but just like sneeze or anything like that on on recording and I'll probably just like sneeze a bunch after I'm done <laughs> just to kind of make up for not doing it early on so apologies for that in the north we see a megalith just kind of hanging out with his little dude bros nice little bricks he has some uh, trebuchets with him as well and it's just crab 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 on the brain here for literal he does have chicken as well love his foods he has a crab and chicken and hopefully he doesn't delve into monkeys That'd be a little weird. We do see a couple of uh, Percy's get very close to this fat boy. They take out a shield. But there are some Percy's to assist as well as a secondary fat boy as well who also doesn't have shields. Both the shields here for Team 2's fat boys are down. Sorry, third one is in online as well. That's starting to be very dangerous. Team 2 getting three fat boys in close proximity. Good thing because it, you know, critical mass. Bad thing because of the whole critical mass thing for Team 1. So... And the fact that, of course, a nuke could kill all of them pretty easily. Which, to be fair, I have not seen one at all this entire game. No nuke launcher has been spotted by your fellow caster here. I see artillery has been done very quickly here for Yoji. So Team 1 has an artillery emplacement. Team 2 also has an artillery emplacement. This air grid not going to feel well here shortly once the uh, Duke is dealt with it. Second Duke coming online here shortly here for Squealer. This egg grid needs shields immediately here for Gimbal. Fat Boy now done here for Cyrito. Cy uh, and that's the message for it. Artillery now done for little. Explosions happened. Explosions in the southwest. Kramer, control case, says, well played. Take all my base. I messed up. Looks like there was an air fight, and I missed that. Apologies for that. Looks like he possibly sent his ASFs in by accident. And uh, that's really going to hurt Team 1. There's a, obviously a huge host of ASFs in the east that are now shifting south with 173 to be in fact. That is a lot of ASFs to have. Three satellites online moving in tandem. There is a Monkey Lord up here that was was being built. Huh. Anyway. Uh, four satellites, says uh, PsychoAd. Well, there's technically three. I don't see the fourth one. I guess fourth one is under construction, to be fair. So that's what he's pointing at. I guess he can't see the, the holograms like we can, which he can't because he's on the other side of the te other team. But the air grid is protected for now, and I do like the fact that it is decentralized, so there's no sort of easy cascade to take on an entire air grid. So love to see that. 44 minutes on the clock here. Team 2 has one, two, almost three artillery pieces that I can see. Almost four, excuse me, because Little just started his second. In the north, huge brick wall inbound. And here comes that brick wall. Brick wall engaged. Gotta love it. Gotta love to see it. And it just steamrolls that entire position. Obviously, heavy losses, though. For Team 2 is literal, but it broke through the defenses. Once again, that's the second time, I believe, that uh, Yoji has built that position, and now it's been wiped out. Artillery, of course, is uh, still pumping out shots. That is the threat, though, is if that crab and brick wall gets pretty close to that artillery, that's going to really hurt, specifically now that Team 1 has two artillery pieces online. They're not targeting the same thing. One's targeting, I think, the one from Literal, and one's targeting the one from Squealer. His artillery, his second one, is online now. Those two, three artillery pieces now confirmed to be online. Looks like they're targeting the satellites, not going for the air grid. But there are gunships inbound, and with the ASFs being completely devoid in the south there for Team 1, it opens a huge opportunity for those broadswords to just wipe a ton of energy off the map. How is Yoji's power consumption? Oh, he's doing more than enough. So losing those pigeons is not going to hurt. What they, what did they do with that mass, says Neogun? I don't know what he's talking about. Team 1 sitting at 2.8k mass. Income Team 2 at 2k. Maybe that's what he's talking about. How 
He thinks there's a lot more mass for Team 1, which uh, there is. There's almost 50% more for Team 1. Down the middle here, just like a knife straight through butter, cuts the entire middle out for Team 2. This Colossus is almost defeated, though. There's a lot of Ravagers that have been built and are continuing to be built, so that Colossus is going to go down here shortly, and that attack will peter out very, very quickly. Don't know why they just didn't sent it kind of over the water here, but I don't know. Maybe they just wanted to go down that vector again. Be like the third or fourth time. Looks like Stinky Joe's annoyed that Kramer cost Team 1 the match. I wouldn't say they cost him the match yet. I mean, they're losing stuff to be sure. He's probably just annoyed he's losing his uh, satellites. That's his third one that's going down. The fourth one's going to go down, and the fifth one he was building is going to go down. He needs more AA coverage. And there goes Stinky Joe. He control carries. He's kind of fed up with it, which I don't blame him. I'd be annoyed too. It's just part of the territory, you know. Sometimes things happen out of your control, and that's kind of it. We do have some SSUs that, oh, that cascade's got to hurt. Mm. Yoji gets that base. He's lost this base. So essentially when he had this base, he had it for a little bit. And Gunships came in, wrecked it. Stinky Joe, control Ks. Now this base is handed over. That's not going to last very much longer, especially with Team 2 having their own satellite overhead. That brick attack and Colossus get close. Or invading force, I should say, gets close, but not terribly close. The artillery is still online. Team 1 building another one over here. That one's going to go down to the broadsword threat. Maybe. There is AA in the base, and, of course, the gunship's kind of just slowly hovering into range. Once that shield goes down, that might be it. There's an SMD over there. Again, no nukes, not even Billy nukes. In a game with six UEF players, if I remember correctly, half of the match, no Billy nukes. Very weird. I don't like that. Six UEF. One of you has to build a building nuke. It's like almost a law. Almost. You have to build a building nuke. Still, though, I will admit, Zerbit still has control of the middle of the map. Not giving it up anytime soon. Two artillery pieces now targeting his position. That's not going to feel good. We see the artillery here for little almost done. So it's taking a little bit longer. Looks like he switched over to Novax for a second. But he also has another artillery up here. So he has two already. A third one is underway. Four artillery pieces, and I think they're all targeting... Well, two of them at least are targeting the same thing. They're targeting the artillery from Yoji, and two of them are targeting the one, just the base of Zerbit. Zerbit now has lost his main shield protecting his comm. The fat boy threat has gotten worse. There's four of them now. In this base on the Supple Plateau is uh, not good. It's not good here for uh, Team 2. It's not looking good. We do see some T2 actually trying to slow down this attack. Once again here from Literal, he's sending in one experimental. Decent amount of AA. Decent amount of uh, direct fire weapons in the Brick and the Loyalist Department. And just kind of not really building a huge force. He's kind of like, okay, I'll assault this position, take that out, send back what I can. And then send the next force in, do the same thing, kind of just slowly whittle down uh, Team 1's defenses. The shields are down. One, two, punch. Kills off the artillery. And Yoji, that's not going to feel well. He's lost half of this base down here from Stinky Joe. He's lost the other one here from Kramer. He's lost his artillery. Team 2 has five of them now online. Four Dukes and one Disruptor versus one Emissary now. Art says Psycho Ad. And Yoji's team recalls the match, saying it's over, it's not going to happen. And to be fair, in Team 1's regard for that, there are five artillery pieces online. Not a lot of shielding can hold up to that firepower. There's a satellite for constant damage. There's a second artillery that I didn't even notice right there. So that one was, I think, newly minted. But it wasn't going to matter. They traded one for one. Team 2 has 5. All even literal has to do is just take his 3 and target one after the other. Squealer, all he had to do was target, you know, that or something else and just put a lot of pressure somewhere else. And that was pretty much it for that point. Even if the game continued to the end end where everybody just died by artillery or gunships or whatever. So Team 1 wins the game here at a little bit over 49 minutes. MVP for this game has got to go to literal. He drove a lot of the success for Team 1, especially in the north. He held off Yoji quite well. Of course, uh, his team of Psychoad did die not super early, but decently early. And so he had a nice little second base, and he used that to really pump his eco, get his T3 
land game going very quickly. And just kind of held for a lot for a long time. We do see in the middle decent back and forth here between Stinky Joe and Cyrito. But the balls on Team One's player of Nazar. I think that was who was here, if I remember correctly. I kind of forget sometimes. I mean, he's like, this is my base. I'm not going anywhere. Good luck. And to his credit, artillery you know, was raining in and started to pick apart it, but no land engagement was really successful at piercing the middle of the map here. So Team 1 was doing decently well in the middle, but it just, again, was the matter of fact of this map kind of lent to you know easy choke points to try to hold, nice little you know kill boxes, specifically up here and up here. And they kind of just settled in for the long game, and that's how they won. And sometimes it's just how the game goes. But let me know down in the comments what you felt about the game. Of course, if you haven't done so already, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. Let me know down in the comments what's your favorite moment or MVP or whatever else you want to tell me about the match or anything in general. Thank you so very much for watching to the end of the video, and I will see all of you in the next one.